Hey, hey, I'm Shay Keister, and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast, the beef producer's place to explore new management practices. Thanks for tuning in, and welcome to the community. Hey folks, I want to take a quick break from the episode to talk about my friends at Corel Technologies. Corel Technologies is changing the way cattle producers cross fence and utilize their pastures with their easy to use and cost effective virtual fencing program. Virtual fencing allows you to save time, cut costs, and get the most out of your grazing lands by remotely containing, moving, and tracking your cows. This was designed by a cow-calf producer for cow-calf producers. Check out their podcast episode with me from July 27th to get an in-depth look at the process of virtual fencing and how it is impacting the beef industry as we know it today. If you would like to see the system work in person, feel free to reach out through their website about field days. You can also find more information on their website, www.corraltech.com. Howdy folks, thanks for joining me for another episode. It's Shay here. And today we're going to be talking about bale grazing. We haven't really talked a lot about fall or winter grazing. And today I am bringing on Aaron Nervous, and he's from Manitoba. And he's going to talk about how his family has a pretty unique grazing operation, or I guess it's different from what I'm used to. And it's, it's a neat one. So Aaron's going to talk about how they use bale grazing in the winter, what kind of their fall and spring grazing looks like, as well as what their moves look like in the summer. So I'm excited about that. Now, before we dive into this episode, I do want to remind you that I am booking speaking gigs for the end of this year and into 2024 right now. So if you're interested in having a speaker at your event, whether that's about podcasting, advocacy, or simply finding your voice and discovering how to share it, I cover all those topics and would love to be a part of your next event. So go to my website, casualcattleconversations.com, and on the contact page, you can reach out to me. With that, let's visit with Aaron and learn how we can improve our grazing strategies. Well, Aaron, it is great to have you on the show today and to have the opportunity to record a conversation. I know maybe we should have recorded our previous conversation before this, where we were talking a little bit about what you guys were doing, and I was trying to understand your operation a little better, but I really sure, I I sure am appreciative of you taking the time to be on the show today. And I know you're a fellow listener, so that's even more fun for me. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Well, to start off, would you kind of give the audience and those listening a little bit of background on where you're located and what your operation kind of looks like today from a big picture perspective? What are you guys doing? Sure. Yeah, so location-wise, we're in Canada, so we're along the Manitoba-Saskatchewan border, and we're straight up about three hours off the U.S. border, so straight north of uh, Minot, about three and a half hours. So, um, yeah, it's it's prairie land, obviously. Um, we're kind of up against or transitioning into what I think is called the boreal forest, kind of more parkland region. So it's not completely wide open. There are valleys, a lot of bluffs, um, traditionally kind of a mixed farming area. Although as the way most things have gone, there are no mixed farms really anymore. So grain farms and or cattle now. Mm -hmm. Um, So what we do here is um, there's three families involved. My parents who live on the main operation and then me and my brother uh, we're also partners. Our farm is incorporated. Uh, it's a family farm, but but mm-hmm. corporately, and we're we're shareholders and employees of that corporation. So we each have me and my brother each have spouses, but they have professional jobs outside of the farm, so they're not involved in the farm per se from a, a daily management point of view. And so what we do, we're we're a cow calf operation. Our land base is mostly owned, some rented. It's 100% perennial forage, so that's either grazing lands and or um, haying lands. And sometimes we we leave the haying options open and sometimes graze the haying lands and vice versa. Um, so yeah, 100% perennial. We have about 550 cows. We have a smaller registered herd of about 75 cows, and we kind of use AI and raise our own bulls to use on our commercial cows. We actually haven't bought an outside animal in for 20 years. So we've been bringing mostly, well, everything in through AIing for influence. 
And so then we sell some breeding stock as well, some breeding bulls, some replacement heifers. And we also do a little bit of direct to consumer meat marketing as well. That's a yeah. lot. You've got quite a bit going on there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's good though. Yeah. So what we're really going to talk about today is your grazing strategies and specifically the bale grazing side of it. But I guess my question for that, as we go into it, you know, you talked about kind of taking the holistic management approach. So to you, what does holistic management look like for you on your operation? What does kind of your, or maybe a better question, what does your year round grazing look like? Um, okay. Well, just to give a bit of context on the holistic management, we took a course uh, close to 20 years ago now is 2005. And then me and my brother took it at that time. My parents took it the following year. So all farming partners were involved and what the course really brought to us was just kind of understanding your operation and your goals, um, a lot of goal setting involved and not just, uh, you know, certain parts of the business, but different facets and how they all kind of are intertwined and rely on each other, whether it's, you know, the people side of it, um, you know, the financial side of it or the land side of it. So they're all kind of tied in together and, and having your goals um, on paper, uh, that's very important. So that was kind of the catalyst for um, our holistic management and, and a bit of how we changed our, our management. My, my dad was always kind of um, an extensive low input type livestock producer, even from the start. So it wasn't really like it was you know, a major change, but it, there was a lot of minor things that we changed and the grazing management was probably really the number one thing that we changed that really, I, I would say took our operation or management to, to a different level, I, I think. So oh, go I have ahead. a question with that. So you said there were a number of smaller things that you kind of changed and then the grazing management is really what's impacted your operation the most. Is that what you started to change first after these courses or was that kind of later on? Because there's a lot of planning that goes with grazing management. I'm just curious, what was your first change you kind of made when you took those holistic courses? Yeah, that was a major one because a, a lot of the fundamental um, principles behind holistic management is, is the health of the land and the land being really like, yeah, I know a lot of cow producers are really, you know, they're cow first people. And it just comes to them naturally. But if you think about it, really, your land is your most important resource. And then your cows are just a harvesting tool that you need to manage accordingly to turn it into pounds of beef. And so the land management was really the major thing and, and probably what we changed right away. And it started with just basically splitting paddocks. Like my dad was, um, he wasn't really a, a rotational grazer to any degree. So it was mostly set stock. So what we did was just started splitting paddocks, um, giving land rest and recovery, and then, you know, starting slow, not, not making a million changes at once. Um, and, and then just kind of building on that success from there. And, you know, now we have, I don't even know how many paddocks we actually have. It's probably over 120. We have some different management groups too. That's not all just one massive herd, but, um, yeah, over the years, just splitting paddocks with permanent single wire high tensile and, I mean, and, and electric, like electric is huge for us. Once your cattle are trained to it, I mean, all you need is one wire, even on, even on perimeter, but um, we, we've maintained our, our barbed wire perimeter fences, but anything new now is, is used with high tensile. Also, when you get to a certain point, then you start splitting with temporary wire, with poly wire and rope. And that gives you just added flexibility. So you started with splitting paddocks. You said, when did the bale grazing come into play for you? Oh, the bale grazing actually came into play very, very early as well. So um, I would say we started experimenting with it shortly thereafter. Um, I think our course instructor at the time was bale grazing and, you know, and he wasn't saying that we should bale graze, but he was just sharing his experiences with it. And so we decided to start experimenting with it. And then I, I guess really we just, we liked a lot of the things it had to offer. Um, and then 
just sort of tweaked, changed different things to suit our operation in specifically, and then really our goals, management and lab and uh, lifestyle, basically. Okay. So would you talk about kind of your year round grazing strategy? Cause you've talked about paddocks, we've touched on bale grazing, and I know you do dormant season grazing. So would you kind of talk about what your year round grazing program looks like? Sure. So here, here's our, we have two main goals. And the first one is really to, to keep improving and have our land produce as much forage biomass on an annual basis as possible through land management, basically rest recovery and animal impact. And over the years, we probably got to two times, maybe even 2.5 times on average from when we started to what that land can produce on an annual basis. And our, really our second goal is to have the animals graze as long as possible. So take the mechanical feeding, the mechanical um, haymaking out of it as much as we can and, and let the cow do that. Um, because why not? She can. And ultimately it should affect your bottom line if you don't have those costs associated with that. So those are our two main goals. And then, so from a, from a grazing standpoint, um, I'll start with the bale grazing because it's just, it's easier to start from there. So our winter feed period is about 120 days. So we, we calve in May, start May 1. We wean around December 5th. Uh, calves are pulled off the cows and then the cows usually go straight to the bale grazing from there. Sometimes we will stockpile graze a little bit longer if the weather is mild. But uh, for the purpose of this, we'll just say that we go straight to the bale grazing. So they're, they're there for the months of December, January, February, and March. And then usually around the start of April, depending on the snow melt, um, we will start grazing stockpile grass as soon as we can. So in, in an in a early spring where it's ideal, we'll start April 1-ish and we will graze without supplement to around December 1st when the calves get weaned. So that's an eight month period of grazing without supplementation. That's, that's our goal. Mm -hmm. And so the split on that is because, you know, we don't have a vegetative period or a growing season that's um, eight months or 240 days. It's more like 110 to 120 days from when grass starts growing to the first killing frost. So we will, we will have about a, a four month period of growing season grazing, we'll call it. And then we'll have about four months of stockpile grazing on the shoulder seasons. So that's basically April 1 to about May 15th. So a month and a half in the spring, and then about two and a half months in the fall. I believe that's like September 15th to December 1st-ish, if that makes sense. So you said no supplementation whatsoever throughout the year? No, um, we will or at times if we get like, say you get a snowstorm in April, okay. Like, you know, and, and it's just not conducive. They'll go to the bush and kind of all huddle up. We will roll out some bales at times. And if we have a late, a late thaw where the snow is crusty and, or there's too much snow, I mean, we will have no choice, but to supplement a little bit at, at that time. So we try not to, that's the goal, but we will supplement at times. Now I don't really truly believe that you need to, if you have the right management the right grass in place and the right genetics in place. Now, if you don't have all those factors in place, sometimes I think it is good to supplement. I'm not saying supplementation is a bad thing. It can be very, it can be a good management tool. But like you said, there are other factors that go with it, where you look at having the right grass, the right management and the right genetics to go with it too. Yes, for sure. Yeah. So then on the genetic side, what do you look for to make sure that you are selecting the right genetics for your program? Well, just a lower input cow. So that starts with a moderate mature weight, a moderate mature frame score. That's important. What is, what is moderate and mature for you? Um, well, as as weight, weight, and frame score. weight about, frame score. I would say average working condition of a cow, 1,250 pounds. Okay. And frame about 4.5 in that range, somewhere okay. in there. Yeah. So there, 
they're shorter and they're not like, you know, miniature cattle by any means, but they're shorter and they're thicker and they're wider. They have uh, more hard girth, more forage capacity, I would say. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of our goal or what we're looking for, for an animal that matches the system. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. Just, I know there's a the couple of things and the size and weight of cows definitely varies by region and operation. So I always, when someone says a moderate cow, I always like to ask, well, what's your definition of a moderate cow? What do you think a moderate cow is? I usually like more, I'm used to more five, five and a half even closer to, we have some closer to that six mark too, but I mean, I think to me, five is moderate, five, five and a half, that's moderate, but. Yeah, yeah. A um, couple other things in terms of, you know, what we look for in terms of genetic influence is moderate growth as well. Like, I mean, you don't want lo completely low growth. I mean, we still have, we still have to fit our animal to a certain degree to the commodity market or what's acceptable in the marketplace. So we, we don't want to get too small. We don't want to have too little growth, but there's a line there and we don't want to be like, you know, selecting high growth cattle. High growth cattle are fine if you have the resources, but if you're trying to do a more low input model, they they won't really thrive per se in that model. Um, we try and moderate milk as well. Like we don't want really high milking cows, just adequate milking cows. Mm -hmm. And then also like the maternal qualities that come with that. Um, functionality, ease of calving, structural, Absolutely. structural soundness. Cause our, I mean, we're rotational grazing in summer. They have to walk half a mile to water in winter. So, I mean, they have to be athletic cattle. So with your summer grazing, how often are you moving paddocks? It depends on the time of the year, but on average, about every two to three days is what we do. There are times where, where we'll be a little more intensive and move daily. There are times like say calving, for example, where we will um, have longer intervals. And that's really only just because of um, contentment with the mothers, you know, and not causing mm -hmm. that big ruckus when you're trying to move them. So we sacrifice a little bit and move slower in calving season. And then when the grass starts coming, then we'll start speeding it up slowly. So, but on average, I would say two to three days per move. And the three day is kind of ideal from a second bite standpoint like we don't want to be regrazing the second bite like the, you know what i mean like we don't want the cow have taking the second bite of a of a plant that's trying to recover and regrow so she bites it once and then we're out of there the plant just regrows from there and it doesn't have any kind of uh um like it, if you graze it the second time or say your cows are in there for 2 weeks you know there will be it will set it back a little bit and not allow for adequate recovery. But if you can make it your, your moves nice and quick, it will recover that much quicker. And then we also like to like keep some residue as well. Like we're not, we don't want to take it down to the, to the wood either, like to the, to the soil. Um, take half, leave half. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes we take a third, leave two thirds. Sometimes we'll take two thirds, leave one third. So it's, it's really depending on a lot of factors but we do like to leave residue because I mean, that's your solar panel, right? And your ground cover. Hey folks, you are working to preserve the ground for the next generation. Shouldn't your cow herd be built for the future too? Neogen is the industry leader in beef cattle DNA testing. They built the first DNA test for commercial cattle and continue to make advancements every day. Igenity Beef is a DNA technology that will help you select the most desirable females based on their true genetic potential with 17 traits, 3 custom indexes, and parentage. Watch Igenity Beef catapult your genetic selections by assisting in selecting only the females that meet your operation's genetic goals. Use code RADIO to get 20% off your next Igenity Beef order. Learn more about how Igenity Beef can aid you in selection, management, and marketing opportunities of each calf crop and your herd. Go to neogen.com or call 877 877- four four three six four eight nine and that code and website are also in the show notes so i kind of want to shift more towards the bale grazing conversation in general and hone in on that a little bit so you said you start when you took those holistic management courses that was one change that <clears throat> excuse me came on early for you earlier on but you also said that 
you know, on previous conversations that you bail graze a little differently than some people. So would you kind of talk about maybe the strategy you started with and how you've changed that to what you're doing today? Sure. I think generally most people, when they bail graze, they will set up grids of, of bales spaced X amount apart, and then they will take temporary wire and give the cows usually three to five days at a time. And then they'll also have another wire set up ahead of time. So when they take the, the lead wire down, they're just leapfrogging wires and then they'll keep setting up the next wire and the next wire. And, and we did that for off the start for sure. Um, as we experimented a little bit with longer moves, we went to a week, 10 days, two weeks, and then we just thought we would try something a little different where we, where we were wintering, we had enough cross fencing there. So we could just set up bale pods as we call them. So 21 days feet at a time set up in a block with no cross fencing. You give the cows open access to that full 21 days. And then when the cattle are done, you make them clean up. You have to be pretty ruthless on that. And it does help if you have really cold weather the last two days. Mild weather is detrimental to cleanup. But then we just move the cows to the next pod. So we, we're never moving a wire. We're just moving the cows instead. And it, it works quite well. Are those bales wrapped with twine or net wrap? Um, twine. Uh, there's a re like, I mean, we buy some of our hay, we make some of our hay. So if we're trying to, it's hard to find twine mm -hmm. uh, bales for sale. Cause I mean, 90% of the people making hay now are using net wrap. And for obvious reasons, speed and efficiency is, is the main one, but we try and find as much. We have a twine baler ourselves and we try and source twine bales. If we source net wrap, we usually bring that feed back to the home yard because we do some other feeding to our sale bulls and, and some other management groups, but the twine bales will go straight to the bale graze site. So that's another thing about the bale grazing is you never want to handle that hay more than you have to. So don't bring it from where it's produced to a feed yard. And then from the feed yard to the bale graze site, take it directly from where it's made to the bale graze site to kind of eliminate that logistical transport cost. And then the thing about net wrap is if you have them on the bale graze, usually you'll have to tip the bales up on their end, like a Coke can, remove the net wrap and then flip them back over. Because for us, the preferred way to bale graze is as they sit coming out of the baler. So on the, on the roll, so to speak, not on the end. So the two faces are out. You can see both faces of the bale. Correct. That's right. Yeah. And we just find that that's, it's just more efficient. Um, the like wind can mess you up a little bit. If, you know, if you have a windstorm come through and you got all your twines removed, especially when they're sat on end, like they'll just sort of blow apart. And also when the cows eat them, if it's the right type of feed, they will kind of just apple core the bales and then the top just kind of falls down. And it's the really the most efficient way that we found over the years to do it that way. So to answer your question, we try and, we try and get as much twine only bales to the bale graze as possible. And then we will remove all the twines before freeze up. So usually that means October 1st, October 15th, somewhere in there, we'll get all the twines off. And then everything is set up for winter. So we don't, we don't start a tractor all winter to feed 550 cows for 120 days. All we do is go up there with the snowmobile, check them daily, check the water, and then salt and mineral as required. So on the waste side of the conversation, would you say you have more or less waste with what you're doing now? Like as far as the bale grazing, do you see a lot of waste or your cow is trained enough where they don't waste much? I mean, maybe compared to other producers, what do you think you see on the waste side? I would say compared to if we were putting it in bale rings or rolling it out or putting it through a processor, our waste is no more. It's, it's no more than any of those systems. There's a caveat on that though. Like it, there's a lot of factors that go into getting the waste down to a level that's that acceptable. And, um, one, your cow, like your cows, if they're trained to the system and they grew up in that system, I mean, that's obviously a huge benefit. I think if we brought in, say, say you had 200 cows and, and then you, all of a sudden you bought 200 cows that came in and, and had no clue about the system. 
like I don't think it would work quite as well. But since our cows have been basically grew up on that system their entire life, they they know the drill. And we do we're pretty ruthless when we make them clean up. But it's really only a, a two day period, right? Of 21. It's a very small percent in terms of their feeding period. So it it's it's not a detriment to the, them at all. The other thing is is that you need to balance your feed quality properly. If you're going to try and use like straw, um, poor quality feed, uh, coarse grass, um, maybe green feed oats, something like that, you probably don't want to do 21 day feeds, uh, feed periods. You'll probably want to shorten that up. We try and have at least two thirds of our pod as alfalfa grass, decent quality hay. And that's, that's important to getting the cleanup. They just they just clean it up way better if it's a 50-50 mix of alfalfa and hay and grass, I mean. So now do you buy most of your hay or we buy about two thirds of our hay and we make about a third. What's your reasoning behind that as opposed to putting up your own hay? Well, it goes back a long way because our hay land or our productive land that's suitable for haying is in a valley. And we had several years where we had flooding problems where we could not harvest any hay there. So we were forced to go out and find feed if we wanted to keep our cattle numbers the same. So we sourced hay. We kind of liked who we could buy from, the quality we could get. And then when that valley land kind of recovered to a certain degree, and it hasn't been flooding nearly as much in recent years, we've made the decision to hay some of it and graze some of it and then keep our contacts of where we've been buying hay in place. And so we're kind of trying to balance that made feed, bought feed. And so it just, it seems to work for us quite well. But the reason for us initially buying feed was because we were forced to. And then this is kind of the result of that, where we got to today. Okay. Now you mentioned that you don't have problems with wildlife eating off of the same bales that your cows have, correct? Like wildlife really isn't an issue for you. You don't really have to account for that when you're thinking about how many bales to put out each year. No, it's fairly minor. Um, we're lucky here that we don't have elk uh, populations right at our place. So we've never had elk into our bales. I know other people that do have to deal with those problems and, and elk can be a real significant problem because they eat a lot. They're big animals and they will tank the feed just due to the, like um, urinating and defecating on the feed. And then the cattle won't want to eat it. Deer on the other hand are smaller animals. They don't really eat as much. And we're, we're not using super quality feed, like say second cut alfalfa, for example. So deer would rather forage and we we have got them into our bales, and but it's usually at the late end of the season. So March, when you know the winter's at its end, they're getting a little bit hungrier, the snow is crusty, and they can't forage as much. We do get some damage, but it's pretty minimal. And then a side benefit of having stockpiled grass in and around our bale gray sites is that we have and it wasn't really made by design to do that, but we've just found that the deer actually would rather forage through stockpile grass than come and eat at our bales. So we don't mind coexisting with them. Okay. So as you think about your bale grazing journey, your grazing journey in general, maybe if you could start over, what would you do differently? Oh, well, it's <laughs> a good question. I guess start sooner. I don't know if that's a very good answer, but, um, and then just really put priority on the land and the health of the the land, the soil, um, you know, the species, your composition of your forage, the rest and recovery, um, you know, making a, an environment, you know, a lot of people don't even consider what's under the ground, right? I mean, and then like your soil, your organic matter, the, the microbe, microbe activity underneath the soil, all that health is critical to having a, a healthy functioning ecosystem that really is the most important thing in the whole big picture of what we do. Economically, 
how has this impacted, or maybe, you know, economically from a profit standpoint, how has this impacted your family's operation? Cause you've got three families. I know, I mean, I know not everyone is full time on the operation, but you still have three families that are pulling from the operation. So from a profit standpoint, how has this holistic management impacted your business? I think it's, it's been very beneficial to a profitability standpoint. Um, I, I mean, as you know, I know the, the beef industry is tough. It's tight. Um, you know, uh, the, the, what we get for our product um, and then, you know, our input prices and the, the way the price of land has gone, the price of fuel, I think, I don't have a, a crystal ball, but I, I think that a lot of producers are, are going to be forced to change how they do things. And I, I guess I like to think that we were maybe a little bit ahead of, I guess, maybe reading that. I mean, I'm not sure if that's why we did it at the time, but it seems in retrospect to be a good move, I think. And I, I, I just, yeah, I think it's going to get tougher as we go to be profitable in the cattle industry. And so well, I think you need to do any, everything that you can to, to minimize, I mean, don't starve the profit, don't, you know, don't starve the profit or management out of your operation, but um, like really keep a handle on your input costs and think of different ways that you can do things and not be stuck in a mindset of this is the way it's always been done. And, oh, what will they think if we're doing it this way? I mean, all, all that stuff doesn't matter. You have to do what's best for you and what fits your operation and, and your family. Did this change how you market any of your commercial cattle or seed stock cattle at all? Or did you keep those strategies kind of the same when you switched to the holistic side? What changed from your marketing standpoint? Yeah, that changed too. I mean, we, we really sell breeding stock to like-minded people now. So we, like, we tell our story on social media and our website. We try and attract the right type of customer to us instead of, you know, being just one of many options. Mm -hmm. So we really try and <clears throat> attract the right type of customer to us. And now I would say 90% of our sales, we're selling to people that, that kind of believe in, believe in and do the same things that we're doing. I think that's, that's important. It, yeah, it's 100% important, important. So that you said that's on the seed stock side, but you have, I know you sell direct to consumer too, but do all your calves go through your direct to consumer or do you market through a sale barn or do you have direct relationships with feedlots? What does that side look like? Or, and did that change? No relationships with feedlots. We are, so our calves, the females, we actually sell, we market most of them mm -hmm. as, as, um, as replacement females to other people that kind of want a cow like we have. So they're buying them to make their own cows. Um, the little bit that we have extra or that don't make that grade get sold into the commodity market just at a local auction mart. The steers, so we're, I mean, we're obviously not keeping all our all our male calves as bull calves. About two thirds of them will get cut. And in the past, we've had luck selling to kind of other like-minded people that are running yearling operations or grass operations and they'll buy them from us They'll overwinter them, background them, they'll put them to grass, and then they'll usually sell them as short keep feedlot animals. So we prefer to sell to, to people that we know and more of a private sale if we can. And if, if uh, market conditions and or supply and demand dictate that we don't have those sales, then they'll go to a, a local auction mart to a pre-sort sale. Awesome. Well, thanks for going into that. So Aaron, as we kind of wrap up today, if you could share any last bit of advice for someone who is considering moving towards a holistic management approach on that grazing side, what would that last, what would that advice be? Um, I guess my advice would be is just take control of your own destiny. Um, whether that means, you know, taking a holistic course and or a course similar to that it doesn't have to be holistic management. Um, the other thing would be to find a mentor and or or multiple mentors, because there's lots out there. And that is one, you know, social media has a ton of negative <laughs> connotations and things to it, but there's a lot of positives that can come from it. And an online 
is an unlimited resource to find people, um, you know, and information to help you out. So I think that's huge and find, you know, find, find discussion groups and or peer groups, kind of support groups for, you know, what you want to do. I think that's important. It's all about finding community and like-minded people who can help push you in the right direction. It's important in any industry. Agreed. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, thank you very much for taking time out of your day to be on the podcast. I appreciate it. No problem. Thanks for having me. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.